will happen quickly and we won't have any problems very long. All right, so let's pray and let's uh, jump into our study tonight. Uh, as we've been looking at emotionally healthy spirituality, we've kind of taken a sidebar to look at the seven deadly sins to better understand how Ephesians 2 and James 4 tells us that the flesh, the world, the devil are the three adversaries that we're dealing with that are constantly causing these struggles. So we see how the seven deadly sins are manipulated, are used by those three uh, to bring about all sorts of bad behavior. I, I have. I don't have uh, everything on there. If, if you don't mind grabbing it while I pray. Um, can, you, can you turn all that stuff on? I didn't think to get my mind to it. For the folks who are watching online, you'll be able to hear much better in just a second. Um, thanks to my lovely wife who usually does not say, you should be louder. Um, but in church, I guess that's a good thing. Amen. All right, so let's pray. And we're going to jump in. Father, we thank you, Lord, that we can gather with you tonight. Lord, I'm hearing so many praise reports. We've got so many people who are having significant medical issues. But yet, we're hearing so many wonderful praise reports. I thank you, God, uh, that you are moving in Rick's life uh, with this brain matter, that there is going to be a radiation treatment to put an end to that bleeding, bring him back to his full and normal self. I thank you, God, that you're moving in the lives of Gage and Casey so that it can be identified what, what has caused uh, their blackouts and, and uh, events. Uh, so that they can have beautiful, happy, healthy lives. I thank you for the blessings that we're hearing uh, from Rainier and his lovely wife, both of them uh, being touched by God in miraculous ways, as well as Sam uh, with the weight loss and, and uh, the reports that he's getting on so many levels uh, where you're just moving in a mighty way. Lord, all of these, we thank you, God, that um, time and again, doctors are saying, I'm not sure how it happened, but this is good. Uh, we know how it happened. And we thank you, God, that you are indeed on the throne and able to heal. But not only physically, also spiritually and emotionally. So Lord, we pray that you would do that work in us tonight. Uh, help us to be healed of the emotional issues that lead to this deadly sin called sloth that we are about to discuss. Help us to recognize it, to overcome it, to your glory. And for this, we thank you and give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. So, we are on number six of seven. And then we're going to be kicking back into emotionally healthy spirituality. When we do so, I'm going to have some workbooks for you, my treat, uh, so you can follow weekly on, on what we're doing. And um, we will uh, watch a little bit of uh, some uh, short videos for those to help expound on it. But I think that the knowledge that we're gaining from understanding the spiritual implication of the seven deadly sins and how the flesh, the devil, and the world use these matters against us will help you tremendously in understanding uh, and building an emotionally healthy spirituality as we move forward. Okay, so here's a question for you. Last week, we talked about envy and you know, when it comes to envy, some folks come in and say, ah, it's okay. I don't have to worry about this. And then you hear what envy is and you hear how it works and you say, uh, Anybody experienced that last week when you realize that maybe envy is a bigger problem? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, if you felt that way about envy last week, you might want to put your seatbelt on for yourself. Oh. oh. Um, sloth, not the animal, the spiritual condition. I would 
assert. This may be the, it's either the most significant or it's tied with Bangalore, which we will discuss next week, as the most significant factor adversely affecting Christianity today. Now, the problem that we run into is that most people, if you ask them, what is Islam? We will take the secular answer, laziness. But remember, when we started our discussion on the seven deadly sins, I said, do not take the secular definition. Look at the biblical definition. Uh, sloth is often categorized as either laziness or depression. Not only in the secular context, but even within Christianity, they will just kind of throw it into that category. And that's not, act, that, that, that's not a, an actual biblical um, definition or understanding of sloth. So what is sloth? Though I will say laziness does play a part, but you have to understand the context of that. To understand sloth, let's go back to the originator when the seven deadly sins were actually eight. Uh, Evagrius referred to this as a city, A-C-E-D-I-A. I'm not going to quiz you on uh, your Greek or your Latin for that matter. But um, this word that he uses, he identifies it as the noonday demon. Now, where does he come up with that title? Many of you are familiar with Psalm 91. In the shadow of the Almighty, thousands may fall in the right hands of God. Not going to read. Verse number six says this: "You will not be afraid of the terror by night, or of the arrow that flies by day, or of the pestilence that stalks in darkness, or of the destruction that lays waste at noonday." The Vagrius contention was that the destruction that lays waste at noon was a spiritual malady. It, it talked about when you're hitting kind of that pinnacle and you lose steam, you lose interest, you are tired of the fight, etc. Uh, Evagrius will go on to flatly say of the seven deadly sins, which he sees as demons, this is the worst one. It's hard to see that perspective in a contemporary age when we are inundated with inaccuracies and generalizations and the tendency to just define swap as laziness. You know, there are people that we consider slothful at work or in our family. I mean, there's Geico commercials that talk about the sloth in this way. There's books on how to be a better sloth that celebrate the laziness and, and this mentality. And, and the freedom of, well, if nothing is expected of me and I have no goals, I can't fail, no harm, no foul, everything's good. There's all kinds of problems with that, <laughs> first of all. But even that approach is not really getting at the totality of the biblical definition. Sloth is not synonymous with laziness in the secular sense. It's not synonymous with depression, though there are similar tendencies and expressions between biblical sloth and depression. But it is not simply depression, and it can't be because depression is not a sin. That's typically something you can't control, whether it is from an event that happened to you or a chemical imbalance, construct, etc. Now, the condition of biblical sloth is certainly depressive, but I think Thomas Aquinas, Aquinas captures it better. He describes it as an oppressive sorrow. It is an exhaustion of the soul that has resulted from spiritual battle and strength. 
So the consequence of biblical sloth is this. It's a spiritual apathy. At very best, you're going through the motions of church, of religious life. You lack care for and are even weary of spiritual good, spiritual life. You have a comfortable indifference to the duty of discipleship. You're not invigorated to get in your word. You're not invigorated to pray like you once were. Remember how Jesus, in the seven letters in the book of Revelation, the very first one he writes to the church in Ephesus, and he says, remember your first love. Note how you have fallen from that. Repent with zeal. He'll tell them. So there's this issue of you just kind of coast. You neglect your walk with God. You neglect the ministry that is needed by others. Now, the way this is often compared to depression, the reason that some people will read the descriptions of sloth in the Bible and say, oh, man, they're talking about depression, that these these early writers are talking about depression, clinical depression. Well, there are some similarities, as I said. Major depression is usually exhibited by a withdrawal. And in a spiritual sloth, sloth, there will be a withdrawal. You might be in church, but you're not really at church. And chances are you're not at church. Or you're not at church like you used to be. And even if you're there on Sundays, you might not be there for the seminars or the we're going out and feeding the homeless on Saturday or we've got a prayer conference or whatever the case might be. And you're not in your word, as I said. You're, you're, you're not in the disciplines. Things that we once considered pleasurable activities. Now, when the depressed individual withdraws, it will have an effect on their sleep patterns, their appetite, their energy. There will be an increased sensitivity to rejection. There may be a loss of self-confidence and self-regard. And interestingly, all of that is true of the spiritual sloth as well. They will not be themselves. But this is happening in a spiritual sense rather than a physical slash and or emotional domain. What makes the condition unique is that, as I said, depression may be from a formative event. It may be from a lack of something you needed in that formation, which we've talked about and we'll continue to talk about when we return to emotionally healthy spirituality. Uh, it may be a traumatic injury. It may be a chemical imbalance. Spiritual sloth is the exhaustion of the soul that results from spiritual battle. It is the most explicitly the most religious of the deadly sins. Some of them are at the other end of the spectrum from religious activity. Spiritual sloth is right in the middle. It actually results from if you're not careful. It is concerned specifically with the, the human yearning for God and the religious duties that result from this. And so what happens is, as I'm going to elaborate, um, there are reasons that as we, begun, as we begin the race of faith, we don't want to run anymore. There are reasons. Think about, Paul keeps talking about be like the epic, compete, finish the race, finish the race. In about 2 Timothy chapter 4, he says, I have fulfilled my ministry, my calling. He, he is reiterating the need that God doesn't need more good starters. He needs good finishers. What caused you to quit running, he asks. Think about Jesus in the parable of the sower. The good seed, some of it hits hard ground, can't penetrate. The demons just soak that right up. Some hits ground and begins to take root and begins to grow. But then they hit a hard time. And they stop growing. And they stop producing fruit. 
or they never produce food. That's what we're talking about, the rocky soil. That is a good indication of sloth. So I'm going to talk to you about ways that sloth enters in to the new believer who's excited, who wants to draw closer to God, who wants to do everything God's called him or her to do. And then all of a sudden, they start losing that zeal. Why? As they lose that zeal, Thomas Aquinas defines it this way, an aversion to the divine good in us. Really what it comes down to is love. Church Father Augustine wrote a phenomenal book called The City of God. And he says essentially there are only two cities. The City of God and the City of Satan. And what determines your citizenry, which one you belong to, is love. Citizens in the city of God love God. Primarily. That's their first love. Citizens in the city of Satan love something else more than God. Typically themselves. It's love of self. What it comes down to. Which is going to grab them the name in a little bit. But sloth, I said, you know, there are some laziness aspects. Sloth has more to do with being lazy about love than being lazy about work. Yeah. Because here's what love requires. Let me put it to you this way. Christianity ain't for men. That's right. How many times you say that? Hold on. <clears throat> the love of God, God loves you enough to meet you right where you are at, but he loves you enough to not let you stay there. It's good. Yeah. And that means change. And that may mean giving up some things that you like. And that may mean offering forgiveness you don't want to offer. Or developing godly character when you would rather do something else. Live a different way. That's going to be the contention. De Young puts it this way, a wonderful statement. Slothful people want the easy life. They find detachment from the old selfish nature too difficult, painful, burdensome. So they neglect to perform the actions that would maintain and deepen relationships of love. They harden their hearts toward any change that requires sacrifice or surrender on their part. So if you think about contemporary Christianity, you see a whole lot of people who want to affirm that Jesus is Lord, and they want to go to heaven, but they don't want to become heavenly. They just want to have a get-out-of-hell-free card, right? <laughs> And they want to live the way they want to live. And then people get offended because they say, well, if that's God, I don't want anything to do with it. And you say, well, that's not really God. How many churches have active discipleship programs, growth programs in spirituality? Why don't they? Because sloth says, God loves you just the way you are. Just hang out, do your best until Jesus comes and it's all good. None of that is in Scripture. Quite the opposite. So sloth is advice for those who want the security of God's love and God's salvation without the real sacrifice and ongoing struggle to be made new. I was talking to uh, Pastor Chris today about how excited I am when we, when we start talking about the judges very soon. Um, and I'm doing a class on judges uh, separately and um, talking about how there is a cycle of sin in Judges where the people will go and do their own thing and worship whatever God they want to for their own benefit. And then they will become oppressed by hordes and armies and spiritual forces. And they'll cry out to God and they'll say, well, we're your people, God. And God will send a Savior called a judge and deliver them. And they will live in right saying of God for a while and then they'll fall away. But eventually, God gets to a point where he says... I'm done. Because they continually want to do their thing rather than God's. 
That's the heart of sloth. When you're stuck between a self you cannot bear to be with and a self you can't bear to become. You know that you're not in right standing with God. There are things you don't like about yourself. So you run to God. And God says, awesome. We're going to work on this. Okay, but these things are contributing to that. You need to be, well, I like that. And the question becomes, who's going to be God? Who's going to determine the way ahead? City of God, city of Satan. Sloth is that little voice that says, why not? Or it's okay. You don't have to work toward this. God loves you just lean on. We want to be unconditionally loved without having to condition our own selfish desires in return. In other words, we want maximum benefit with minimum contribution. We want God to do all of the saving work, but step aside as we walk in our daily steps of what we choose to live in life. And how we develop our own character. How we view other people. How we view ourselves. And our responsibilities. So sloth becomes a sin not because it makes us lazy. But because we have a lazy attitude toward God's will. for his love. A loving relationship, especially in the context of God, is going to require an identity change. Don't be shocked by this. Look, Adam and Eve are in the Garden of Eden. When they sin, and sin enters the creation, there were catastrophic, catastrophic consequences. It completely changed Adam and Eve and all of their offspring. It completely changed the creation. The entire world went into turmoil. The earth. Storms and pestilence. And then you have all the murders and all the sin, sinful activity. All, and God's going to renew all of that. But think about the cataclysmic consequences when sin entered the creation. Now, God's answer to sin is Jesus Christ. The Son of God went through a cataclysmic change. The eternal spotless Lamb of God became flesh, was susceptible to temptation, was brutalized physically, spiritually, and emotionally, bore our sins on the, on the cross, and forever in heaven is still wearing the scars of that. He was undeniably altered in this way. Sin undeniably altered the creation. The response to sin undeniably altered the Son of God. How will our response to God's invitation not undeniably alter us? We're the only ones in this equation that thinks, I can get the maximum benefit without any change. Uh, Think of the change the Son of God went through in order to facilitate, to enable this forgiveness. This is where sloth comes in. There must be a commitment to daily transformation. So sloth is really a resistance to God's effort to allow his love and his transforming power to come to you and through you. And it can't get through you until it transforms you. But through you, remember, what's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, and strength. What's his second? Love your neighbor. Love your neighbor, love your neighbor as yourself. Upon the interest of all the law and the prophets. That was Jesus' statement. So the number one thing is to love the Lord your God. And when we love God, He say, I love you enough to tell you, that's going to kill you. That's going to destroy you. That's going to send you to hell. That is not the image in which I created you. That is not my intent for you. I understand a lot of this is not your fault. You didn't know things happened to you. I'm here. We're going to fix this. But then we say, but I'm just problem. It's like, Going to your doctor who says, hey, um, you're 200 pounds overweight, you're now diabetic, you're looking at congestive heart failure, you're going to need to change your diet, and here's the diet I want to put you on, and you say to your doctor, 
Yeah, but it's really not a problem fighting two pizzas and four Kit Kats a day, right? Whoa! <laughs> Whoa! And your doctor says, well, yeah, that's a problem. And you say, Where'd you go to school at? He doesn't know anything. I feel fine. Yeah. Right? The voice, man. So, sloth is resistance to transformation, which is not only invited and available, but demanded by God. He created us and he redeemed us to be like him. To free us of these things that we think bring us freedom, but actually bring us bondage. Put another way, if you're taking notes, this is the one right now. Sloth sabotages sanctification. Now remember, there's three works of grace. Not in his grace offers salvation, right standing with God. Forgiveness of sins, clearing of the account, you're a new creation. And by this, he puts his Holy Spirit in us so that we can be transformed into his life. So we're not dealing with all that bad fruit, all of the anger and the bitterness and the unforgiveness and the conditions that we were in and the emotional breakage that we've had. He helps us overcome all of this to become everything he's called us to be. That sanctification. Setting us apart unto God and for the service of God. What sloth does is it sabotages sanctification. It says no. To your own change, which consequently says no to your affecting change in others and blessing them. Once again, uh, referring back to the young, she says, instead of rejoicing at God's presence in us, the slothful resent the claims that God's love makes on them. Rather than being willing to dedicate themselves to developing and deepening the relationship, they resist its demands. Although sloth can appear symptomatically similar to chronic depression, it is not a matter of brain chemistry, but rather a habit of the heart. Sloth is not primarily a feeling. It is well entrenched and willful resistance, even as love is fundamentally a choice. So it's a thing of saying, look, I recognize that you're God, and I'm going to worship you, and I'm going to honor you, and all that kind of way, but then I'm going to do my thing. That's sloth. And, and why do we feel that way? Well, because God says, this is the way I want us to go, and we say, well, I don't want that way. I like this way. Or, you just don't know what I've been through. I can't overcome this. So it's easier for me to stay here. It's much like the studies that have been done where animals placed in a cage, and they're treated well, and they come out of the cage. Uh, it's with great difficulty, and so they put them back in the cage, and they feed them, and they comfort them, and then eventually they'll open the door to the cage, even remove the door to the cage, and the animal won't be in the cage. Because it finds security in the cage. Salvation opens the door to the cage. Sanctification enables you to come out and become everything God calls you to be. Sloth says, you don't want to do that. It's too hard, or it's too comfortable in here. Either way, think about the rocky soil. You hit a hard time. Think about Paul saying, finish the race. You run in a marathon. I run, I, 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 you know, topped out half marathon. And, I, and the whole time I'm running, I'm like, why am I doing this? Why am I this crazy? Um, I, I mean, I buy 25 miles and I what? put on 80 pounds of gear and Ruck hike up the mountains for 23 miles. But the whole time you're going through it, what are you thinking? Finish. Finish. The finish. Race. I want to finish. And then you come to that walking. Right? The wall. And you hit the wall. And what do you want to do? Quit. Quit. Everyone will hit a wall. As we go forward into emotionally healthy spirituality, I'm going to talk about a critically important theology. First written in the fourth century, a guy named St. John of the Cross. He called it the dark night of the soul. 
is where you hit the wall. And God says, there's no way around this. You can't go under it, you can't go over it, you can't go around it, you gotta come through it. And you gotta come through it with me. And it's something, it's something in your past, it's something in the construct of the way you view the world that God says, we're now through it, and I've got to help you with this. And it's going to be painful, and you don't want to do it. This is sloth on steroids at this point. The question is, how are we going to respond? Okay, before we get to the dark night of the soul, the fact is that many people will never hit that wall because they don't even get past the starting points in the race. Some do start the race, but do not finish the walk. Why would anyone start the race and not finish the walk? Why, why would anyone reject God's love when he says, I got something better for you? And we say, no. You know, in our minds, we think it's like, let's make a deal. You guys ever seen that show? Yes. Monty Hall? Yeah. That other guy, Wayne Brady, your, your guy from, uh, uh, whose line is it anyway, uh, is on now. But, you know, you can have this brand new home entertainment center or what's behind door number two? Well, it could be a Corvette or it could be a goat. <laughs> There's never a goat behind the door with God. But there's never a transformation that is not difficult after God has done this initial sanctification on us. Because now we're getting into the deep things. And we just don't like that. Oh, we like we like what we like. What do you mean I gotta stop doing that? I don't see a problem with this. This is where you get people on Wednesday nights, and you're welcome to give me a call. Bring your Bible. And a lunch. And a lunch. I'm going to eat it. When you have your wine Wednesdays with Jesus, I'm going to wear you out. I'm telling you right now. You are leading people down a wrong path, and you know who I'm talking to. And this Jesus loves me in my potty mouth. This ad, that sloth. That sloth saying that I'm good enough where I am. If you are good enough where you are, Jesus wouldn't have had it gone to a cross. Right. Amen. Right. None righteous. No, not one. Isaiah, and by the way, no one that I'm looking at, to include myself, and I'm pretty sure everybody on that list right there, no one is fit to wear Isaiah's sandals. Hmm. And he said, my righteousness is as a filthy rag. Yep. He understood this. We are never there. Paul said, I have not arrived. There is a perfecting principle, a Christian maturation, but John Wesley himself, man, I get tired of John Wesley and saying, John Wesley said that Christian perfection is you can be sinless. He never said that. He said you'll never get to that point until you get to heaven. Sloth tells you you're good enough right where you are. Look how far you've come. You've come a long way, baby. Um, that's a cigarette commercial, by the way. So why are we using that in theology? <laughs> It's sloth, and I'm here to tell you, it is tickling your ears. It sounds good for the preacher to come in and say, God loves you just the way you are. It's okay the way you are. If God loves you just the way you are, then he would not have sent his Holy Spirit to transform you. That's true. He loves you with an unending love, but he doesn't love what sin is doing to you. Sloth tells you, you're good just the way you are. Listen to Galatians 5. Should be a familiar passage to most of you. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. See, when the Spirit wins out, you may not do the things that you please, because your flesh wants to do them. What are our three enemies in this context? Ephesians 2 and James 4 lays them out. What are they? The flesh, the, the world, world, and the, and the devil. devil. The flesh, the world, and the devil. And right there, Paul's laying out in Galatians 5. You're going to be led by the Spirit. You're going to have to crucify some flesh. You're going to have to surrender these things that are not of God. 
Sloth is the old sinful self resisting the transformation into the new self of Christ. That's the spiritual battle that most people will do. Oh man, the devil's on my back, and I'm dealing with this, and I'm fighting this, and I'm he's tempered into that. Really? Your battle is with sloth. Because sloth is saying, just look up your soul. You're okay. God loves you. And the Holy Spirit is saying, no, onward, onward. We've got this. Got to push. You've got, you've got a victory already in Christ. Just keep going. When we choose to find fulfillment in something other than our relationship with God, which is a transformative and a participative relationship, we become content with being less than we really are. Now, some people will go right past that statement. We become content with being less than we really are. Meh. Well, I hold pretty strongly to the Augustinian view of original sin, not in totality. Um, I think you gotta bring some other theology in to bring it to fullness. But in describing original sin and in describing sin, he talks about ultimate good and lesser good. And, and we talked about this. There are things that are good, but not ultimate good, not God good. And we settle for lesser good. And James says, to know to do right and not do it is sin. So by doing a lesser good instead of ultimate good, we understand that is by nature sin. Now listen to that statement again. You're being content with being less than what you really are. You're accepting lesser good. By definition, that is sin. You see, we think of sin as just you know, murder and adultery and that kind of stuff. To know to do right and not to do it. When God is beckoning us on in this transformative process, and we just look at God and say, no thanks, I'm good. You're lesser good. You're not ultimately good. Though you're playing a part of ultimate good because you're determining whether or not you're good. Welcome to the RV. This is a beautiful place. A little sarcastic. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you yes. see how we're falling into the same trap as Adam and Eve? But we're rationalizing. They did too. So. Sloth enters in when this transformation becomes difficult or undesirable. It also has a tendency of entering in when you grow weary and well doing. Rainer Jail hones this definition by describing a saving in sloth in the context of ministerial burnout. And he characterizes the spiritual phenomenon as exhaustion, weariness, sluggishness, as well as sadness and hopelessness. Most licensed ministers won't last five years in ministry. That's national statistics. It's just true. They won't last. Duke University did a study in 2013 of the most stress, stressful um, jobs leading to health issues, um, outscoring military, police, firemen, medical, top of the list, number one, ministry. That's the spiritual battle. So why are so many ministers quitting? You grow weary and well And Sloth says, it ain't worth it. It ain't worth it. I mean, that's what you're saying when you say no to transformation. It, it ain't worth it. What God is promising me ain't worth it. It, it ain't going to be as fun. It ain't going to be as pleasurable. Or the effort I've got to put into getting that is just not worth it. It, it doesn't balance out. Well, that's what we say with growing weary. And, well, dude, this isn't worth it anymore. I quit. I throw in the towel. Now, it will happen in our daily devotional life, prayer, worship, scripture, sacrament. It will happen, uh, we will become averse to God's presence, to God's people. We don't want to minister to them anymore. We get sick and tired of hearing what they're dealing with, etc., etc. 
God's love demands personal discipleship and personal ministry. Sloth's resistance to love's demands is empty. You don't need to grow, and you don't need to worry about that. Here's how it will show up. I want to tell you the two ways you can identify sloth. In your own life, but even if you see a brother or sister that's struggling. Number one, despairing resignation or apathy. I just don't care. Despair. Indifference is, is what I'm talking about. That, there's not that passion, that zeal. Take a moment to think about a time you were presented an invitation to experience God in your own life or to introduce God in the lives of others. Maybe it was, hey, let's worship God. Let me invite you to raise your hands and worship you. Maybe somebody said, hey, we're doing this Bible study in the morning. Do you want to be a part of it? Or somebody bought you a really cool-looking devotional book, and you can commit to this. And, or the church is hosting a seminar. Or you have an opportunity to teach a discipleship hour. Or to go on a mission trip. Or maybe the phone rings and your caller ID says, oh, it's that brother or sister. Always need me and keep me on the phone. And, and you just said, why not? That's sloth. That's sloth. Sloth shrinks back and recoils from something good and divine instead of taking delight in it. And even if you do it, you're still like, all right, I'm going to go. I mean, let's, let's be honest and shame the devil in the house of the Lord. Have you ever had one of those days where I just don't feel like going to church? I don't feel like dealing with Sister Susie Bucket now. And I don't feel like dealing with this, and I don't even know why I'm going. And, blah, 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 and you show up, and they start singing the first song, and you sing along, and you're like, well, maybe I should have my arms crossed. Let me put them on my back. Uh, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Save the wretch like me. And you're like, yeah. yeah. Looking at your watch. And then all of a sudden, as you sing, you start feeling a little bit better. And all of a sudden, you feel better. And all of a sudden, you just start. Worship me, God, and then you're like, God, I'm sorry, I can't do this attitude. And then the word goes forward and God speaks in your life, and you're like, man, I'm glad I came today. Has anyone else ever had something like that? <laughs> I had multiple yeah. Sundays like that. Yeah. Okay, that was a slothful attitude that was overcome by an experience with God. So there was a battle, there was that Galatians 5 battle taking place. But you committed to the spiritual discipline and went. And it made a difference. Listen to 2 Peter chapter 1. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness, through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Now, for this very reason also, apply all diligence in your faith. Supply moral excellence. And in your moral excellence, knowledge. And in your knowledge, self-control. And in your self-control, perseverance. And in perseverance, godliness. And in godliness, brotherly kindness. And in brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me pause and just say, many of you know this verse, and have you realized he's talking about sloth? He's talking about people who aren't finished in the race. And he's encouraging them. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about God's calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. 2 Peter 1. Read it. Pray over it. Focus on it. When you're feeling down in the dumps, when you're feeling slothful, 
This is Peter saying, I don't, I get it, I know, I, I've been there, I've done that. Keep running. Keep running. You're almost there. Keep running. You're about to get a second win. Keep running. Now, I said that resistance, lawful resistance, manifests two ways. One way is apathy, a despair. The other way is escapism or avoidance. You either have apathy or avoidance. Schimmel once said, a paradox of sloth is its ability to mask itself in fervent, misdirected activity. I love the way he puts that. Fervent, misdirected activity. What am I talking about? Oh, there's people who are busy in the church, and they are doing it, doing it, doing it, and they're not going to get to them. Because they have no relationship with God. It's not works. Because you're saved by grace and faith, not works. And they may have been in a right relationship with God at one point, but then God said, all right, here we go, run the race. And they said, I don't like that race. I'll do this. And to overcompensate where they know they are telling God no, they do a whole lot of this. Oftentimes more than what it would have taken. Exactly. Once again, you will see this often among ministers. And when I say ministers, you're all ministers of the gospel. You all have a ministry of the God. But in pastoral ministry, pastoral ministry and ministry leaders will often neglect their spiritual reading, their prayer life, and they'll substitute a task-oriented life. And they'll do all of these things for the church, and they'll do all these things to keep people happy. And they're not encountering God. Their soul sleeps while their body is in motion. A recent study found that 65% of pastors work 50 hours or more each week. Now think about what I said about the Duke University study. This is a different study. 52% only spend one to six hours in prayer weekly. Wow. 5% spend no time in prayer. A Pew Research Forum found that the average American only spends seven hours in prayer and Bible reading daily. The average Christian, seven minutes. I can't. Oh, I'm sorry, seven minutes. Minutes, not hours. Um, seven minutes. Cheyenne can't say the blessing of our meal in seven minutes. And typically, she'll pray over everything of the day and then forget to say, thank you, Lord, for this meal. Um, wow. so, so what ends up happening is we get busy doing good things that are not necessarily God things. And it's easy to find scripture to validate or rationalize our fervent activities. You know, the, the Proverbs, Proverbs 6, talking about the, the ant. The busy ants, and, and, and don't be lazy like the ant. Uh, uh, the Apostle Paul saying, work with your, your hands, finish the race. Do these good things. Faith without works is dead, right? So we say, get busy about it. Now, this is one of the reasons there was great importance placed on the monastic community uh, in regard to work and the need for manual labor. It's part of, it's part of the cultural mandate. I get that. But now we're using the works that we're doing, we're sprinkling scripture on it to justify our, our inability, our unwillingness to submit to God and, and what he wants us to do on this side, right? So when you have that, you know, from such a faulty assertion, you easily step from the proverb, an idle mind is the devil's playground. And, and you go into Henry Ford's statement. Work is our sanity, our self-respect, our salvation. Through work and work alone may health, wealth, and happiness be secured. His attitude sounds righteous, but it has actually forfeited that which is righteous. It is contrary. It is unrighteous. Take a moment to think about the good works that replace God works in your life. Now, God's got plenty of God works, and we can get busy about it. And it might be in a secular field, but 
location. It might be in ministry. It will always be an individual relationship of engaging God. But what are the God works that God has called you to do and why are you not willing to do? And, it, you know, if it's, a, well, I don't have the resources, or I don't, you know, there's a way to deal with that. But I'm talking about the, nah, just don't do that. Why? So what we end up doing is we use these good works as diversions. A lot of times, I'm not only looking for ministers who are just apathetic and just aren't themselves and aren't really committed anymore. I'm also looking for the ones that are busy doing everything except what God has laid upon the heart of the investing to be ready to do. Why are you doing all of those things? You're typically running for It's an aversion. It's a duck diversion. Blaise Pascal, phenomenal philosopher, Christian. Um, he also invented what would become a calculator. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, moving on. Pascal said this, talking about diversions, without diversions, we should be in a state of weariness. If, if, he said if we just remove diversions, we would be in a state of weariness that would spur us to seek a more solid means of escaping our, our conundrum. But diversion amuses us and leads us unconsciously to death. Think of how many diversions you have in your life. When God says, hey, let's do this. Oh, Star Wars stuff. Got to check Facebook. Right? We'll not only have, and I know I'll get sometime, we'll not only have an aversion to that oneness with God and allowing Him to transform us. Here's another way sloth presents itself. Oh, I'm so glad you're all seated. You may want to be as well. Um, your aversion to the transformative work of God in your life will also be seen as an aversion to the community in which God works that transformation, a.k.a. your church. You see, church is critical because this is where God uses his body collectively to help raise up and strengthen one another. Iron sharpens iron. We learn from who cannot continue in the participative, transformative work of God apart from the church. He designed it to work through his spirit amid his community. The epitome of this is called heaven. That's like going to heaven and having nobody else there. What's the first thing you hear about heaven? All the angels, everybody singing. All my family's going to be there and everybody. Could you imagine if God said, hey, you're welcome to come to heaven, but you can't talk to anybody. you got to go over here in isolation. Wow. But that's exactly how everybody. <laughs> that will be done on earth. Sloth is the reason. John Cassie put it this way. And I'm pulling pieces out of his book. It makes a per sloth makes a person horrified at where he is, disgusted with himself. He's talking about a massive community. Um, so a church will say that. Disgusted with his church. And also disdainful and contemptuous of his brothers. He groans quite frequently that spending such a long time there is of no profit to him, and that he will possess no spiritual fruit for as long as he is attached to that group of people. He makes a great deal of far off and distant monasteries, churches, other churches. Look at that. Describing such places as more suited to progress and more conducive to salvation. And also depicting the fellowship of the brothers there as pleasant and, and utterly spiritual cast. Thereupon he says that he cannot be saved if he remains in that place. He must leave his church itself and get away from it as quickly as he can, for he will perish if he stays there any longer. Next, he glances around anxiously here and there and sighs that none of the brothers are coming to see him. So he's bashing the church because they can't possibly give me what I need, but then he's mad at them for not coming to see him. 
Preach. Preach. What Cassian is talking about nearly two millennia ago are church hoppers who are always going from church to church to church to church and never satisfied. The reason they're not satisfied, I'm just going to lay it out there, is because they're running from God. Because at every church they go to, God's still going to say, still want you to work on this. And they're going to blame the messenger. That's slaw. That's the working of slaw. Right there. When you become discontented with church and with the people. I, I made a comment before. You have a great praise and worship team coming here. We'll pack the place out. You have a prayer vigil? Crack it. People that are here right now. Because the praise and worship makes me feel good. The prayer is God speaking and addressing and, hey, now I'm committing myself to others. That's a sloth issue. Okay? So, what's our answer? Let me hit these real quick. What's the answer to sloth? How do we counter sloth? Well, obviously, the counter is love. When we love God in this way, we will say, Lord, not my will, thy will be done. Do unto me what you need to do. Take me where you need to take me. Do, do a work in me. How does this come about? And, and not only love of God, but remember, love others as yourself. Service unto others. Is not serious about that. Um, you realize you're going to be rewarded in heaven for your actions? What do you think he's talking about? The obedience to God. So, your reward will really... Mm, this is so good. I was thinking the Holy Spirit. Your reward in heaven is really a reflection of how well you kick sloth out the door. Amen. Because the one thing that's going to keep you from completing this work of God is sloth. Now, he'll use many different tools. He's a capital sin. But at the heart of it, it's sloth. How do we kick sloth out the door? Number one, patience. Now, you know, from our study of that patience has perfect work, that you may be perfect to complete and lack in nothing. Great example. Another one. Hebrews 6, verse 12. By faith and patience, you will inherit the promises of God. Man, that's going to be hard. I don't want to have to address these things. I don't want to have to confess these things. I don't want to have to change these things. Have patience and faith in the promises of God will be yours. Go back and be second year. How about Luke 21, verse 19? Let me read this to you. Jesus says this. In the NASB, it's recorded this way. By your endurance, you will gain your life. The New King James says it this way. By your patience, possess your soul. NIV says it this way. Stand firm, and you will win life. Having done all to stand, stand, therefore, Ephesians 6, the honor of God, right? Number one, patience, perseverance. Number two, seek God's face. How do I know this is a problem? Because when on a Sunday morning I say, well, hey, what did God tell you when you read your scripture this week? And everyone just sits there and says, and they start flipping pages real quick, to try to get something, show me something, show me something, God, show me something. You cannot be in the word of God and not have God show you something. I shared something in book study related to one of the things we read about from my daily reading today. Let me share something with you. As I'm reading this, very familiar passage, I thought, man, this is exactly what we're talking about tonight. Psalm 37, verse 3. Trust in the Lord and do good. Remember? Do. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. And most of you can quote that verse, verse 4. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. But notice the context, and listen to it in the context of sloth. Trust the Lord, patience. Do good, 
obedience. Cultivate faithfulness, perseverance. Delight yourself in the Lord. Meditate on His Word. Read it daily. Pray daily. Plant yourself at God's feet. Number three. Don't worry, I only have 14 on this list. I did. I have six. Go for it. Commit to God's work. Obedience. First Thessalonians 4, verse 1. Finally then, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us instruction as to how you ought to walk and please God, just as you actually do walk, that you excel, excel still more. Excel still more. Some translations will say more and more. Do what you have been doing. Learn how, you're, you've been learning how to live and please God. Keep doing that. Galatians 6. Gotta know that's gotta be in there. The one who sows to his flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap eternal life. Let us not lose heart in doing good. For in due season we will reap if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those who are in the household. Do you hear that now in the context of Islam? And a holy life. Number four. Fourth way to, to beat Islam, run away! Run away from those who encourage Islam. Those who say you're fine just where you are, you're taking this Jesus thing too seriously. Paul says this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, 2 Thessalonians 3. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from every brother who leads you in an unruly life. And according to the tradition which you have received, away from the tradition from which you have received from us. He goes on to say, if anyone does not obey, the instruction in this letter, take special note of that person and do not associate with them. Get away from them, Paul said, because they're going to lead you into a spiritual slumber and you're going to die. So, number four is run away. Number five, stay put. <laughs> you know, the irony is that um, the whole thing with sloth is you're running away from God. That's really what it comes down to. Um, you are to run away from the negative influences, but it's more important to not run away from God. I, you know, now when we talk about the other deadly sins, lust, and you know, you're running away from that. Not sloth. Sloth will tell you run away from your daily life stuff. So run away from your prayer time. Run away from your church. You don't need to go to church every time the doors are open to you. Which becomes you don't need to go to church every Sunday, do you? which becomes the national average is now that people say, well, if I attend church two Sundays out of five, I am a regular church attender. Most people attend McDonald's more than that in one week. <laughs> Stay put. Here's the deal. We're a family of God, and we're a dysfunctional family, just yep. like every other family. Amen. That's right. We are a hospital for sinners. We're going to have problems. We're going to have confrontations. We're going to have clashes. Yep. We're going to get on each other's nerves. We're going to say things that we later regret. There are going to be things like that. Stay the course. We're a family. Just like a marriage, divorce is not an option. Right? Once you're in the covenant with God and with one another, divorce is not an option anymore. Unless biblical reasons come. There are no biblical reasons other than erroneous doctrine for someone to leave church. Or God taking you to do another ministry. Don't give up the show. God taking them. Let me move on. The slothful person is a runaway, a deserter, because they don't want to address it. Maybe they've been confronted with something, and they don't want to address it. Um, one of the Benedictine values in the monasteries is, is called stability of place. Their attitude is, you don't need the monastery. That's yours for life. That's your family. I have that attitude toward ministry. People all the time, for all the chance every time I see them, you leave the church, you're not leaving the church. Please don't leave the church. Here's my answer to them every time. I have no intention of leaving the church. I've had ministers at state meetings ask me, 
Okay, you're in a new place now. You got it all set up. You guys ready to go? No, you're not coming in here and taking it when it's all nice and good. Now it's done here. I have no intention on leaving unless God says go. Amen. But my attitude, I look at people who have pastored the same church for 30 years, and I'm like, yes, look at the stability in that church. Look at the spiritual discipleship. Generational. That's how a church should be. Well, if it's true for me, it's true for you. That is true. Right? Unless somebody is contentious and will not repent, then God says take them out. But uh, it's, it's not fleeing community. Victory in this. It is staying with the community. It's not fleeing from that, staying with God. And especially if you think, I don't get along with it here, but if you choose the church because you like it, you came in on the wrong pretense in the first place. If God brought you to the church to say, I can do a work in you here, and you can do a work in here, uh -huh. you're in the right place. Well, if you believe God has said that, and so God has said otherwise, guess where you are supposed to be? Right where you are. By the way, he is taking attendance. Number six. <laughs> Help one another. When you see somebody struggling in the sloth, 1 Thessalonians 4, starting in verse 9, says this. Now as to the love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone's right to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. For indeed you do practice it toward all the brethren who are in Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, to excel still more, and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and attend to your own business and work with your own hands just as we demand you, so that you will behave properly toward outsiders and not be in any need. Paul is not giving advice on how to address people who have sloth. He's addressing sloth. But notice how he edified them. He affirmed them. He showed them some love. And then he said, okay, but there's something we need to work on. We could use a whole lot more of that in church, right? Mm -hmm. Hey, this is great, this is great. But here's something we need to work on. That's where we've got to go about it. Because if we don't, we're just leaving sloth and issue. You see, why are you sleeping staying there? Why don't you hit the grace? That's how sloth rules the day. Okay. <coughs> Questions? <coughs> Comments? Complaints? I know I went 10 minutes over, but I'm not being sloth. sins in our life don't affect anybody, but they do. And Aiken's sins 
didn't just affect him. They affected his I mean, they took his children and stoned them. Yes. You know, and so there's people who are depending on every single one of us, whether it's our children or just, you know, that coworker that you might not even know, and they're looking at you and they're watching because God's speaking to them, and they're looking at you and they're watching you, and so it's like, well, and we looked at, that's a, that's a great point, Pastor Alton, because we can look at Aiken and say, well, that seems a bit extreme, and yet God can look at us and say, well, I'm trying to transform you of this behavior, and you're refusing to let it go, and because of that, a generational curse isn't going to be broken in your family, and your children are going to end up dying from this. And yet we think that is extreme, you know. It, it, it is. It, it absolutely is. And, and, I, and I want to encourage someone now. You know, sometimes one of the ways sloth likes to creep in is, is we see how far we have yet to go. And we keep beating ourselves up for how short we are, how far short we fall. And, and then we say, man, I'm never ready. It's going to be, ah, it's going to take forever. Listen, it takes 30 years to build a 30 year MOD. This is a lifelong process. You're not going to get there overnight. There are no overnight sensations in Christian transformation. Even you say, well, wait a minute, what about Paul? Well, talk to Paul when you get to heaven and find out. He went to a desert for three and a half years because he was like, okay, I got a bunch of issues. Right here. And even then, he's still the one saying, I'm not going to arrive. You know, we're through the glass darkly. So don't beat yourself up and be like, I'm never going to get there. You're going to get there. Are you going to get there next year? No. Not unless you're in heaven. Are you going to get there at the end of your life if you live to be 100? No. It should be a whole lot closer. Whoa. Psalm 17, 15 says, I will be satisfied when I awaken in your life, so God. That's going to be when you awaken in heaven. But I want the transformation between here and there to be as minimal as possible. That's good. Realize your aching heart. Yeah. Oh, you preach that. We'll have a problem for other generations to come. That's a great point. Great point. Anybody else? Listen, if you struggle with sloth at any time, and you will struggle, sloth is going to come knocking on your door. And I guarantee you, most of you have been in the game long enough, you've already had plenty of conversations. When sloth comes back, if you're struggling with sloth, pray 2 Peter 1. And then apply 2 Peter 1. That's how you basically just put the bill on you. So I'm not, I'm, not even, I'm not even engaging this. I'm not entertaining this. Whenever, it's funny, whenever the enemy tried to tempt, he doesn't do this to her anymore. Whenever the enemy used to Try to tell my wife, say, oh, man, you can't afford to give up to the Lord this week. You can't afford to pay your tithe. She'd be like, I'll do my whole bank account. Don't, don't lay it on me. I'll, I'll. And she did it. She'd be like, oh, pour it all in off the plate. She's like, that is not going to work with me. You need to do the same thing with law. Well, you need to just quit your church. You know what? I'm going to talk. I'm going to be here every night this week. I'm going to ask Pastor Ray, can I dust? Can I, what can I do? Yeah. Women's ministry, do you mind if I sit over there? Oh, my God. Can I sit in the corner just as much as you Amen. Can I watch online? I'm going to watch every video on YouTube. I am telling you right now that I ain't going to quit. That's the attitude you've got to have. Because guess what? When you realize that you can't win that battle, or your flesh realizes I'm not going to win that battle, quit fighting that battle. You don't fight a losing battle, right? Don't give it to the end. Good to go? Next week we'll talk about baby glory. Oh yes. When baby? Be blessed. Look forward to seeing you then.